Um, my name is actually Ranjan. <laughs> but uh, OK, Thank, thanks for the introduction, uh, Pontus. Uh, my name is Ranjan Anantaraman, and I have the distinction of giving you the last talk at JuliaCon. Um, I work for Julia Computing, and I'm going to tell you today about accelerating your Julia code with arrayfire.jl. Um, so we've heard a lot about um, uh, hiding latencies from the other speakers, and uh, I'm just going to tell you how you could use GPU computing to do that. Um, so uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge DARPA um, for uh, funding this work and uh, some of the ArrayFire folks, um, uh, Pavan and Pradeep, for uh, helping me out with this, and uh, my employees, Julia Computing. Um, so um, one approach to hide the uh, latency from uh, all these different computations is by using accelerated computing. Uh, so traditionally, uh, most problems have been solved with um, um, you know, clusters of CPUs uh, in an MPI plus OpenMP kind of model. Uh, but a new trend has been, uh, has been overtaking this uh, over the past few years uh, with the rise of accelerators. As you can see in this graph over here, the number of accelerators has been st steadily increasing. And, it, and as of SC15, I believe the number of uh, accelerated uh, clusters um, in the top 500 has risen to 109. So, um, right, what is an accelerator, though? An accelerator is a piece of hardware that, that is designed for, a speci for special purpose computation. So it can do one kind of thing very well, and that's why, um, that's why uh, we'd use them. Um, how does it do it very well? It leverages a, spe a special kind of architecture, and uh, the accelerators we generally tend to use in practice are GPUs, um, Intel Xeon fees, and FPGAs. Um, so, <clears throat> so uh, what is a special purpose architecture I've been talking about? So, uh, uh, right, uh, so from now on, I'm uh, generally going to be base, basing the talk on GPUs um, uh, in general. So um, if you can take a look at this architecture over here, each of these represents what, what NVIDIA calls a streaming multiprocessor, um, which essentially has a, a, num a, a certain number of cores. Um, and put together, they could have hundreds of CUDA cores uh, across the entire machine. So each streaming multiprocessor will have like a certain amount of local memory, and uh, each one of them will be connected to high-speed uh, DRAM channels that connect to device memory. So, um, so earlier, uh, it wasn't that easy to program on, on a GPU. So uh, usually, you've only had like graphics languages like DirectX and OpenGL that are essentially intended for you to uh, render graphics instead of perform scientific computation. And uh, they have an entire pipeline of their own. Um, the, even if you did want to perform computations through a, through a graphics language, you needed to have expertise in graphics programming, which was a bit of a problem. Um, <clears throat> but in 2007, uh, NVIDIA launched CUDA, which essentially, um, which essentially meant to uh, uh, remove this problem altogether. And, and it soon became a popular uh, paradigm for programming on the GPU. And uh, the CUDA model has uh, now been extended today. So uh, to give you a flavor of what CUDA looks like, uh, this, this is standard C code, which essentially uh, attempts to perform a uh, alpha x plus y. Um, so what you would do is you'd have this very large vector, and, you'd, and you would perform this computation in a loop in serial, um, y of i equals a of x of i plus y of i equals a of x plus uh, a of x of i plus y of i. Um, and you would do, and you would just pass in this very large vector. But in CUDA, what you would do is you would try and specify the kind of computation you want to run on a single element. Uh, and then you launch this, ker launch this kernel massively in, in a, with a certain number of blocks and threads. So these blocks and threads would essentially just map onto the GPU and then, and then, start, uh, then start getting scheduled and um, running in a massively parallel manner. Um, so can you do this in Julia? Yes, you can, in the sense that there is, uh, we have a package called cuda-rt.jl, uh, which, which allows you to write device kernels and compile them to PTX code and then load them to Julia. Um, so what else do we have? We have qblas, qspas, qsolver, qdnn, qfft, qrand, all these which are wrappers that are held together by cuda-rt. So in cuda-rt, you would essentially you would have a Julia array, and you, you'd convert it to CUDA array, and then you'd use all these different lap, uh, wrappers to perform BLAS operations, uh, you know, sparse routines, solvers, deep learning, FFTs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but to do something as general purpose as adding two vectors together, you would still have to write a device kernel in, 
in uh, essentially uh, in CUDA code and then compile it to PTX and load it in uh, CUDA-RT.jl. Um, and uh, that, of course, tends to become a little bit cum cumbersome. So, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I used um, LAFIRE.jl. But you could still do a bunch of stuff with this. And um, I, I just wrote a simple benchmark, uh, a conjugate gradient benchmark, which does use speedups. Um, so there is a certain, uh, there is a, a fair amount of stuff you can do with this. Uh, but again, as I said, to perform something as general purpose as adding two vectors together, you would need to write device code. And, and Julia programmers do not want to write C code. So, um, or C-like code. So um, something like um, arrayfire.jl, would, would really help. As you can see here, these BLAS operations tend to look low level and have obscure function interfaces, which is why LAFIRE.JL uh, tries to ease up this process by giving you easy G GPU computing. So what is LAFIRE.JL? It is a library for easy GPU computing in Julia. It wraps the library LAFIRE, uh, which has which is essentially uh, attempted to solve this low level CUDA programming problem for a while. Um, and they have a great library. And this, is, this, is a, this essentially wraps that library in and abstracts it to give you simple Julian APIs. And um, essentially, uh, there's this AF array, which is a subtype of abstract array that is an array, uh, it, which is an interface to a, a, you know, a piece of memory on the GPU, on a, uh, an array on the GPU, which you would just use in a general purpose manner. So to illustrate this, I'll just, go, I'll just quickly switch over to a notebook. Um, so, so if any of you guys had attended the um, parallel workshop, I had shown some of this earlier. So um, to just generally walk you through this again, before I move on to more interesting examples. Right. So first, let's, first you just need to load the module using ArrayFire. And for some, probably restart the kernel for this. Mm -hmm. Right, so this has been on for a while. So. <clears throat> Right, so um, first, first we just simply load the module by doing using array fire, and then let's say uh, we have we we already have an array on on the on uh, on the CPU. You just create a normal Julia array, which is a which is a bunch of hundred random numbers, and you want to transfer it to the GPU. Uh, so in CUDA, you'd obviously have to do a CUDA mem, mem copy and and a bunch of stuff with with uh, with a huge line and obscure function interface. But in Julia, all you uh, and array .jl, all you need to do is to call the AF array constructor on this. And that would, that should, yeah, uh, generate the, uh, so, so this essentially, this array is now, now resides on the GPU. And it's as simple as calling the array constructor on this. So a small, small side note on this, uh, you are able to see the, no, the random numbers over here on your screen because there is an implicit memory transfer whenever you're doing this on a REPL or an interactive environment. Um, because, you know, uh, and this is by design because people like to see the data they're working with. Uh, but this does not happen when you run it in a script, and, um, it's, and this is only implicit. Now, suppose you want to generate your random numbers directly on the GPU. You could do that by just um, overloading the RAND constructor with AFRA of float64 um, to do this. Um, there is no default over here because uh, flow, AFRA of float64 would fail on some devices that do not support double precision. So um, it relies on you doing, it, it would obviously give you an error but it re relies on you changing um, uh, this particular type over here. So yeah, now we have arrays that are directly on the GPU. So um, if, you, if I wanted to transfer it back to the CPU, all I need to do is to call the array constructor and it's back on the CPU, right? So um, array file lets you do many things. It, it, it again is designed to uh, mimic base Julia and, um, and be as versatile as base Julia um, insofar as the library allows. And you could do simple arith arithmetic operations like you would in normal Julia. You could call the sign. You could, you could do logical operations. You could you know, do any. You could index it like you would a normal Julia array. Um, here I'm just taking a column. Here I'm taking a row and a column again, apparently. And uh, you indexing it uh, with uh, ranges. Again, this, just, uh, this is meant to give you a feel of working with a normal Julia array. Um, again, you could do uh, reduction operations column-wise or um, on the entire matrix. You could do linear algebra, call SVDs, call LU factorizations, do FFTs, and anything like that. So uh, one particular advantage with, you know, uh, with arrayfire.jl and Julia's multiple dispatch is that it lets you write generic code that would run 
both on the CPU and the GPU. And this, I feel, is a big advantage. So I'm, I'm borrowing um, the Black Scholes example from um, Parallel Accelerator um, with a few modifications, of course. And um, running this in simple, single precision because um, this particular GPU I'm running it on uh, does not perform well on double precision. And for some odd reason, this needs to be restarted too. Right, so this, right, so, so this is essentially a simple Black Scholes kernel. You've seen this earlier uh, in an earlier talk. Uh, there are a bunch of logs and a bunch of dots, dots and all those various things. But these aren't all arrays. Uh, some of these are just scalar values, like you would write normal Julia code. And here we go. So we've defined the simple Black Scholes kernel. And we're going to run 10 million iterations on it with different um, in initial strike prices. And um, yeah, now, now we're just initializing the inputs. And, we're, and all we need to do right now is to transfer the, in, the array of initial strike prices to the GPU. And after that, we can, we can run both the CPU and the GPU computations with we're essentially calling the same function and um, with different inputs, and it just works. So, yeah, so that makes, that makes it easy for, peop for people to write just generic code and just have them run on different backends. Um, and this is the beauty of Julia's multiple dispatch, right? So uh, moving on to a slightly more interesting example, which I probably won't run. Um, so, um, right, so one interesting example which I, which I thought of was using, um, you know, k-means clustering to um, perform image segmentation. Uh, so image segmentation is generally an important part of weather, weather forecasting. You get all the satellite data, and you, um, and, you need, and you need to separate this out. Let's say you're looking at a storm. You need to separate um, each region of the storm as, as to its ends and its center and all those various things. And image segmentation is a very useful tool in this. And you could use arrayfire.jl um, for this. Um, uh, this, is, this is borrowed from an example on the original arrayfire website. Um, so, and here I'm just writing my simple k-means algorithm. And if you notice, it looks exactly like Julian code. There are some minor variations because I needed to generate random numbers. Um, but otherwise, it's just, just plain Julia code. And um, what I would do now is I would run, I, I, I'm running 10, iter uh, 10 um, iterations uh, per image. And I, I get an image here that's segmented into landmasses, the storm, and the sea. Um, so, so I actually did a little bit of, um, I, did, I record a little bit of a video here. So let me just explain what is going on. So this is essentially, uh, this is a satellite imagery of the Hurricane Katrina. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to take screenshots at, certain, um, at every uh, certain interval in this particular recording. And I'm going to perform the same uh, uh, you know, image segmentation on the CPU as well as the GPU. And we're going to see a performance difference. So I'll just let this run. So here you can see the, the storm moving towards the land. I, I'm not quite familiar which land that is, but it's moving across land. And now we're going to have both the segmented versions. This is the CPU version. I'm not sure if this is visible, but this is the CPU version, and this is the GPU version. And let's see how they run. So this, this is just, so this has been time scaled uh, to give you an idea of how, uh, how relative performances are. And as you can see, the GPU is about, um, is, is a lot faster than the CPU version. And um, it turns out that it's about, it's over 12 times faster, right? So that's, so that's this. Also, another interesting uh, demo which I had in mind was the simple cat, um, Simple character recognition. Again, I'll probably not going to run this, or maybe I can. Let's see. So, um, so well, essentially, I've taken this particular data set and um, from Google View, which has like uh, different characters, uh, different characters taken from different screen size, um, different uh, street signs, and I'm trying to classify them. I should acknowledge the efforts of a colleague, uh, Abhijit, who uh, helped me with uh, make this demo. So again, this needs to restart. Right, so, um, so what I'm essentially going to do is I'm going to use a simple uh, k-nearest neighbors algorithm to, um, to sort of classify um, my test set and, understand, and classify 
each particular image uh, with a particular label. So again, I load all the requisite libraries, I set my paths, I'm gonna read 20 uh, images of 20 by 20, and I'm reading the training set. Um, I'm just gonna read like 1,000 labels uh, you know, for the sake of this demo. Um, so you might see some accuracy issues. So, so, what, so the first thing you would do is to sort of uh, understand your data, see that there is, um, so the first thing you do is sort of understand your data and see that there's, um, the, um, you know, let Gadfly plot a histogram for you. So um, I hope this is big enough. You can see, you can see there's a fairly, even just as A, a certain number of um, A labels, B labels, C labels, up till about uh, lowercase z, and zero to nine as well. So this is how our data looks like in terms of a histogram. And we can also use interact to see how the various images look like. You can scroll through these. It's kind of fun. Ooh. So, okay, I have no idea what this is, but you can scroll through these, looks like an X, looks like an E. Um, right, so we've only read the labels now. Um, so these labels essentially tell us what the right answers are. They, um, this is essentially the, a set of right answers, and I'm just scrolling through all the right answers now. And, and we're just using this as our training data, um, train our model. So let's read the actual training data, um, all the images now um, into a massive array. Hopefully this doesn't take too much time. Yeah, it's done. So, um, and we now temper the data um, by essentially converting all the characters to ASCII integers. And we take transpose so that every single, um, every, every single column now represents an image. And, um, and now we write our simple uh, k-means algorithm. So our objective right now is to find the right value of k uh, that our model matches. Um, I could run the simulation across a variety of k's, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not doing that for the purposes of this demo. Uh, but it turns out that the right value of k here is three. And um, there, are, there are three you know, important questions you tend to ask while doing something like this. You, you, you tend to define what the word closest means in terms of what sort of distance measure you would use um, and in this case, we use Euclidean distance. Um, and how exactly do you find the value of k? You, you iterate across various um, you know, val uh, values of k, and then you see which one uh, works best and gives you the best accuracy. And um, that's how you define your model. And now I'm going to sc scroll through a simple k, k nearest neighbors algorithm and, um, and run and get our training accuracy. Right. Um, while this runs, I'm just gonna I'm gonna read the test labels, and I, again I'm gonna read only thousand labels for this demo. Uh, read the test data, transpose it, and again um, again use the same um, training uh, training function for testing. So I I could just simply do that by um, Again, uh, by writing generic code, and wherever there's generic code, it can be it can be accelerated by array file. So, go. Again, we can look through our test set, and again, um, now uh, after writing our algorithm, uh, we can look for our bottlenecks, and by using a very nice profile macro, and we can see that. Most of the time has gone in the get k nearest neighbors function. It's actually gone in most of the uh, the distances, uh, the distance calculation, which again be sped up by array fire, and yeah, that sort of runs and gives you the answer. So I guess I've got, guess I have some more time. Um, right, <laughs> right. So um, looks like I sped through this. So let me see what else I can tell you. Yeah. So um, I can show you some benchmarks which uh, I compiled, um, which I compiled um, a little earlier. So these are just general um, RFI benchmarks which I've compared with normal standard Julia functions, and um, 
These are what they look like. I've also written a, a simple non-negative matrix factorization benchmark. Both, both, uh, both these examples can be found in the benchmark sections of RFI.jl. So feel, please feel free to download and test them out and let me know. Um, again, I've, men I've uh, measured single precision performance here because the, the GPU I'm using right now has very poor double precision performance. So um, yeah, I've, I've just shown you uh, how you could use RFI in your work, write generic code, and all you, need to do is to all you need to do is to change your inputs, and it would just run accelerated code. Um, so there are, there are some um, you know, uh, issues and, uh, which I must resolve, and there's, must, um, there's some future work that needs to be done. Um, currently, there's a, there's a small memory management issue which should be fixed um, you know, within the next um, few days in the near, uh, near future. Um, once that is fixed, um, you could, be, you could uh, run massive applications using RFIR um, as long as your GPU lets you and as long as you write good code that accelerates well on your GPU. Um, also, what would be interesting is to integrate with visualization packages like GN, uh, GL Visualize. So, um, so one thing about RFIR is that it, um, it lets you switch backends at runtime. Um, I did not include this in slides, but um, RFIR runs on three different kinds of backends. Uh, one's um, Q, the CUDA backend, which I just uh, showed off, uh, and others the OpenCL backend, so you can run it on essentially any OpenCL compatible device, and, and the third is the CPU backend. The CPU backend is probably the least interesting because you have a great CPU backend in Julia, so you might not want to use that. But OpenCL could be useful and could be uh, used to integrate with other, you know, uh, other kinds of packages. Um, also, something like GL Visualize um, would be useful to integrate there. Also, uh, what would be interesting is to sort of uh, uh, take RFIR and let uh, the rest of the G Julia GPU ecosystem uh, use it. So supposing um, you wanted access to in-place BLAS, RFIR does not give you that uh, interface right now. So if you wanted in-place BLAS, you would want to use something like QBLAS. So um, integration with QBLAS, for example, uh, would, would allow you to do that. And another major caveat is that um, RFIR does not support sparse linear algebra yet. Um, this is an ongoing pull request, and there's more work being done on the library side. Um, so, so that um, so that that's something to look forward to. Um, thank you very much. Uh, which particular uh, uh, which particular um, yeah, algorithm you talking? Like, um, let me see. Let me just get to that notebook. You mean all these? Right. Right. What is it? So uh, the question was, uh, when I uh, call LU on an array fire array or SVD on an array fire array, what exactly is happening? So this is so this is basically a call to array fires SVD or array fires LU, which it's so, which is its own implementation of these different algorithms, and that and they use uh, you know GPU acceleration in their code base and provide an interface where you can call via Julia. That's essentially what's said. Yes. Right. Um, so uh, I was wondering, is that something that the RayFire handles automatically, or is it something that you have to prepare for? Um, you, you would gen, OK, so the question was, um, uh, there's always this classic problem with GPU computing. If, if your uh, data set is bigger than uh, you know, the memory on your GPU, um, so how do, you, how do you deal with that? Does RayFire would deal with it at all? So um, that essentially is a hardware limitation in terms of the amount of memory that's there. But what you can do is you can try and split your uh, you know, data into blocks and stream it onto the GPU and perform computations on it. Another interesting thing you could do was, um, so um, I'm, sh I'm sure many of you guys have attended Shashi's talk, where he used uh, computeframework.jl. Uh, essentially, 
um, let's say you have a cluster wherein uh, some of some of them have GPUs and some of them you, some of them don't. You you could essentially specify this entire um, hardware distribution where you have CPUs and GPUs and stuff like that, wherein you could offload a particular part of your computation to the GPU and uh, make optimizations to work around that. So that's what you would generally do. Yes? Right, so, um, okay, that's a good question. So does ArrayFire combine any kernels, uh, is the question. Um, like, do a fuse of uh, multiply and add. Uh, the answer is yes, but not in the way you might think. Um, so, so basically, uh, what happens, and this, this is actually a caveat when it comes to benchmarking also. So, so let's say I had an uh, ArrayFire array, and I did A plus 1 into 5, or something like that. So Arrayfy is actually an asynchronous library. So uh, what's, what that's going to do is it's going to um, return immediately. So plus and your, your plus and your uh, multiplication operator are both going to return immediately, and Arrayfy is going to execute asynchronously, and control is returned back to the uh, Julia thread, Julia master thread. Um, so in in those particular time in, in that particular thing, Arrayfy does perform a certain number of fusions. But it does that only on elementary math operations, like plus, into, log, sign, and all those various things. But yes, it does perform those optimizations. In a, in a way that's completely hidden from the programmer. So, right. yes? Uh, is there an issue with um, having the host CPU be a non-Intel chip? Have, has anyone tried it, like on an ARM-based system talking to a GPU? Arrayfire on ARM. Um, I haven't personally tried to compile Arrayfire on ARM, but um, that would be interesting to try. I'm, I'm not quite sure if they do compile it. I have a little NVIDIA uh, <coughs> set up with GPUs. Right. Cool. Any other questions? So in that case, let's thank Anya again.